Good afternoon, I welcome you back as we had a summer hiatus from our Bible study. Now we're back on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock, and we started a new study right now, which is on the book of Acts. So I invite you, and those of who are joining us from online, we welcome you back. And those who are present with us, we know that we'll expand in our number as we go through the next uh, several weeks. I want to remind you, as usual, that I have my phone here. And uh, so if you'd like to participate actively, you can text your observations or your questions to my phone, which is 315-345-6534. That's 315-345-6534. I want to start out by asking, sharing a couple jokes. I have little kids in my home, and so we have to have jokes. So uh, this is the uh, first joke I'll ask of you. What meat do frogs like to barbecue? Fly burgers. What? Fly burgers. Fly burgers. Hey, that's a good answer. <laughs> but wrong. <laughs> riblets, riblets. Oh. 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 That was painful. <laughs> <laughs> now here's a here's a religious one. Why does Jesus drive so much? I that confused me at first when I heard this because no, Jesus walks. He walks, I know. But, but it says, why does Jesus drive so much? The answer is because everyone asks him to take the wheel. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Was that less painful or more painful? I don't know. You better sleep in that because she wants that doesn't sound like a little kid joke. No, it doesn't, but these are supposed to be. But my granddaughter will share them. I want to just recommend something to you for your own uh, use in your Bible studies. I uh, actually found this, uh, and I've used it a couple of years ago, um, uh, from Ollie's. Mm -hmm. You can get some good stuff cheap, and sometimes you get good stuff. And right now I've, I'm a little disconcerted, disconcerted because their religious section of books has gotten smaller. Um, for whatever reason, but this is a very good book to have on your shelf to do biblical study. It's called The Complete Guide to the Bible, oh. and what it has has introductions and summations of every book of the Bible, and also has pictures and charts, and it's very concise and very, very good and very, very handy, so I recommend that to you, and we'll be sharing uh, from that uh, today a little bit. Um, and also, I want to remind folks, if they want a copy of my, I've sent it out to everyone on my email list of my manuscript, uh, Irreconcilable Differences, that seeks to explore the, so we can understand the theological reasons behind the split within our own denomination. This split has happened in other denominations as well it's over the similar issues of the authority of Scripture, that uh, my book is being made available um, digitally so that you can just get it online. Um, I sent out the PDF to folks and it doesn't cost anything. If you want a uh, paper copy, um, I've sent it off to the publishers, but I still have the right to make copies. Uh, I do have copies. I'm sending out some copies people have requested. Uh, they're going out by mail. And if you want a, a physical copy, uh, it's $10. And that's $10 it only covers the, the printing cost. Because um, it's about 74 pages and it costs about $10 to be able to, to print that. So um, no profit is going to help for the church. Uh, we have a church down in Georgia that is uh, already going to be using it for a group study down there. And I'm pleased to have been told that. Gary Schopfer is, Dr. Gary Schopfer is leading that. And um, so if you'd like a copy, you can just email me and uh, we can arrange for that. Um, so what we want to do now, we're looking at the book of Acts. And we want to also be lifting up in prayer Aunt Maggie, who is in a hospital. She's looking to go into rehab from the hospital. And um, 
but uh, they're having a hard time finding that. She might be going home. She might have to go home. And have nursing care there. So we want to be praying for Pam. And she's Pam and Peter are usually with us, and they won't be for a while. So let's include her and Peter in a prayer. And maybe other people that we have concerns for. Did you say concerns for Angelina? And concerns for Angelina. And we hope Angelina is joining with us this day. Um, she usually joins us on Sundays and also on Wednesdays. So let's be praying for, for those folks and others that we would know. Gracious living God, as I watch the news and that young mother, that uh, they finally found her body, that she was missing, being kidnapped off the street. And I feel for her children. I feel for her family. And Lord, we just see such rampant violence in our communities. And we question within ourselves. Well, the reason why there is a rise in the violence is not because of a population increase, but rather because of our moral decrease. And as we draw far, farther away from you, so also then people are frustrated and people become more mentally ill and people then do terrible things. Lord, you've given us a call that we might draw close to your word and that we might witness for you. Because as we witness for you, we might also spare people from the violence that is out there in our society. And that we might also help to transform lives that can help to transform our culture. Lord, we pray for our, nature, na our nation. We pray for our culture. Um, Lord, we ask that you might help us to understand your word more deeply, that we might comprehend its truths, that we might communicate its hope to others who live without that hope. So Lord, we just lift up Pam before you. We lift up Angelina. We lift up countless other names that we have on our prayer list and that we also know personally who truly need to have a sense of your presence and healing in their lives. So be with them, yes. The backs inspire us. For this we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts is interesting because it's a second volume of something that's written by um, supposedly so from AD 100. Uh, the church, traditional church, has associated this with Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke is a person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He is also then a person who was a companion to the Apostle Paul. We read that in Paul's letters. He also was called a physician. Uh, Paul needed a physician to call him because he was so abused uh, physically that he had physical needs and being imprisoned and such. And so um, uh, Dr. Luke, uh, obviously Luke is a Gentile name, meaning a non-Jewish name. So we figure that he was not a Jew. Instead, he was then a Gentile, which is important because the other Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, uh, and John, are all written by people who were Jews. And so he gives us a perspective that is a non-Jewish perspective. We also find many other characteristics in uh, Luke and also the book of Acts. He gives us a greater perspective of the women's involvement with Jesus and in the life of the church. And that's important. The Jewish culture... Uh, was very uh, complementary to women compared to other cultures around. Um, a lot of times when we read it, we think, oh, no, that wasn't. But compared with other cultures, women had a higher standing and were protected and guarded um, more within the Jewish Hebrew faith than it was in other places. Um, so that's something to take an understanding from. But Luke has us... Um, uh, describes that the first direction, of course, were women. He gives us their account. There's many other things that he gives us, uh, an account of you know, women's involvement. Um, it's important for us to understand a little bit more. And I, so that's why I wanted to share a little bit from this guide that helps to give a good description. Um, so this is uh, from that I want to share with you uh, as an opening for our study. And this is what it, uh, it reads. Um, in this sequel to the Gospel of Luke, Acts tells the story of what happens after Jesus leaves the planet. It is, gives the story of the birth of the church. Okay. The writer, who most Bible experts agree was probably Luke, starts by closing the book on the Jesus story. The disciples gather on the slopes of the Mount of Olives and watch Jesus ascend into the sky. 
As he leaves, Jesus gives one final instruction to the disciples. Wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. This divine spirit fills them with the courage to spread the teachings of Jesus everywhere, even in Jerusalem, where Jewish leaders had orchestrated the execution of Jesus uh, only a few weeks earlier. Thousands of Jews who'd come to Jerusalem for a religious festival, uh, that of Passover, okay, uh, and, and then uh, so many days, 50 days afterwards, Pentecost, okay, convert in a single day, that's at Pentecost, over 3,000 at that one time, embracing the teachings of, teachings of, G, of the disciples. Jewish leaders retaliate. They bring pressure to bear on leaders and members of what they consider an emerging heretical Jewish cult. By ordering them to stop the blasphemous teaching that Jesus is God's son and that he rose from the dead. Asserting that many, and assert, arresting and trying many of those who refuse and even executing some. This violence eventually drives many believers out of town, but wherever they go, they take their new faith with them, and soon the teachings of Jesus are spreading all over the Roman Empire. So, uh, not uh, coming up next. Uh, the next is that uh, the conversion really happens you know, with the promise of Jesus that He would send His Spirit, that was found in the Gospel of John, particularly, and then also we find that being fulfilled here in the Book of Acts, as uh, then on the day of Pentecost, as they were waiting, as Jesus had told them to do, they wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit would come upon them. That, uh, you might want to get that bee off of your head there. Oh, yeah. Lace your hair. Um, yeah, yeah. Gonna... Um, that all of a sudden, on the day of Pentecost, where they're meeting and praying, all of a sudden, then the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that's what we, we celebrate and remember during the day of Pentecost, in the celebration of the church. So the main point of the book of Acts is Jesus' followers are to spread the good news about him and his teachings everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The writer, the writer isn't identified, though the book is written to an, a mysterious person named Theophilus. Now the name Theophilus is interesting, because the name Theophilus means, Theo is in Greek, uh, means God, and Philos is one of the Greek words for love. So a lover of God. So it has been questioned by biblical scholars whether it, this is just written to all people who are lovers of God, seekers of God, okay? or whether it's written to a particular person. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Church leaders at least as early as AD 100, so within the first century, said the Gospel of Luke and Acts of the Apostles were both written by Luke, a non-Jewish physician who traveled with Paul. The story of Acts covers more than 30 years from the ascension of Jesus in about AD 30 to the trial of Paul in the, six, in the 60s. Luke may have written this book while waiting for, Romans, for the Romans to try Paul in the AD 60s as he was on trial in, uh, in Rome. Or he may have written it in 70s or 80s long after the Romans executed Paul. So I'm going to read from now, they direct me to Luke uh, for um, a little bit more description uh, that I think might be helpful to us. Whoops. Somewhere lost in history, is a fellow named Theophilus. So far, archaeologists poking around in the dirt have turned up nothing about him. But many Christians would really love to know who he was, since he's the reason the third of the New Testament was written by him. The two huge books of Luke, the story of Jesus, and Acts, the story of how the church got started, are actually letters to this, uh, to this mysterious man, Theophilus. It seems as though the writer identified by early Christian leaders as a non-Jewish doctor named Luke is trying to teach Theophilus about the widely misunderstood Christian religion. One theory is that Theophilus was a Roman official in charge of Paul's trial in Rome, and that Luke wrote these letters in Paul's defense. So he was acting not only as a physician, but also 
kind of as a defense attorney. attorney. This would help explain why Acts ends with Paul awaiting trial in Rome. It doesn't let us know the outcome. Okay? Uh, with no word about the outcome. Yet perhaps Theophilus was a Christian who hired Luke to research the birth of Christianity and to get it in writing before all the eyewitnesses had died. Whoever Theophilus was, we hope it, without Luke's letter to this man, we'd be missing, first, a Christmas time favorite, the story of the baby Jesus lying in a manger. The parable of the Good Samaritan, getting that B. That's a land on me. Yes. So the parable of the Good Samaritan is found within the Gospel of Luke. The widow who donated her last mite, a penny-like coin of measly value. The parable of the prodigal son, a young man who loses nearly everything but eventually finds his way home to his loving father. Those are particular to the Gospel of Luke. But perhaps we miss most of all is a single word, Savior. Matthew and Mark skip the word. John uses it just once. But Luke's entire gospel spins around this word and the idea behind it. Luke's story isn't just good news for Jews. It's great news for everyone. An angel puts it this way. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem. So I hope that gives you a little bit more um, understanding about Luke and the author of, of Acts and also uh, a little bit perspective of why he was writing. And also to, to realize that without this, we would not have the story of how Paul became an apostle and how the church was born and how it grew. And even in its persecution, how it came to dominate that culture. The Christians, what's important to realize, did not rise up in arms against Rome. This is an important thing to realize. Once you know the, the gospel had spread, they actually outnumbered the Roman legions. They could have risen up and they could have dominated in society and culture. But instead, they were part of a kingdom that was not part of a political reality. They were out to change lives and people. I think that's important if Dr. Mike was here with us. We have a difficulty, he and I both, when the church gets involved with politics. We believe that we are to be involved in transforming people, people's lives and conveying values. And then they themselves in their activities will be able to shape, help to shape the culture in which we live in and others around the world live in. So I just wanted to bring that as a prelude to what we are studying. Are there any questions that you might have just from what I shared um, from that uh, complete guide to the Bible, a helpful guide? Anything that you would like to lift up? Our faith is built on, you know, should be built on love and not violence. But, you know, That's right. The and and there's, some people, violence. there's some people who are critics of Christianity who then, um, you know, will say that um, Christians were too silent, too silent about things like slavery, even women's issues. The Bible really isn't silent about slavery. We have a whole chapter in which uh, Paul writes uh, about what's called Philemon. He writes about uh, a slave who came to uh, Christ and who helped to serve him in helping to convey the gospel. He sends him back home to a slave owner who was also a Christian, and he asks for him to receive him as a freed man. Okay. There is the uh, end of slavery, but it's asking people to be converted to Christ, to look at people in a different way, and to change how they live. Um, some people say, why well, they should be more politically involved. The same thing comes with other aspects within the culture of that time. And uh, regarding marriage and the role of women, uh, Paul wrote very, you know, um, definitely regarding the equal role of women, we find that particularly in Ephesians chapter 5. But we also find that uh, there are other passages in which he's trying to change how people uh, in their relational role of marriage try to redefine 
without throwing the baby out of the bathwater. And some people then criticized Paul because he wasn't more assertive. Um, but, uh, you know, they're trying to change culture in a different way. Um, how do you do that? How did Jesus, did he get involved in the political uh, realities of his time? You know, he said, that, give up Caesar what is Caesar's, mm-hmm. under God what is God's. So Jesus himself sets a pattern of how we should be involved. Um, we find that particularly adhered to by the Quakers, um, by the Mennonites, and by the Amish communities. Um, who, to stay away from politics and really immerse themselves within um, the faith of Jesus Christ and other groups as well. Well, without further ado, then let's turn then to chapter one of the book of Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, so he always assumes that Theophilus has his former book, which was the Gospel of Luke. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father, that my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We'll find that Jesus' words of that were also mentioned in the end of of, Luke, of Matthew. Okay, as he kind of gives the Great Commission, what we call the Great Commission. So it's not written the same way, but you can read it and it. Oh yes you automatically know um, that, uh, what it's saying. Um, we also can read of somewhat of this ascension. But Luke, Luke gives us more of a clarity of what happened during that ascension, is what we're about to read. But uh, John also, John the, the writer of the Gospel of John, not John the Baptist, gives us clearly the teachings of Jesus about the Holy Spirit, more than the other Gospels. And also the understanding of the role of the Spirit uh, as it was supposed to play out in people's lives. So each gospel provides us with a unique perspective. We see here how Luke has kind of combined some of those teachings uh, together, which is helpful for us. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay. Now, why would they ask that question? <coughs> The hope of the Jewish community was that their kingdom of being covenant people of God is going to be restored. By being restored is not being a puppet people or not a nation, but to be a people of power, a people of position, of influence in the world, uh, back as they remembered in the times of David and King Solomon. Uh, they've been waiting for that. Uh, they were uh, conquered. They were um, exiled. They were restored. They came back and rebuilt the temple. They were under occupation by many different people, from the Persians to the Greeks uh, to the Romans. And so they were looking for the promises that were given in the Old Testament that they should be restored. They were going to be restored. But God was going to, and Jesus was going to redefine who the nation of Israel really was. It was not just going to be the Jewish people but that God's earlier promise that through the Jews, all nations were going to bless. Um, That was what God was doing. So God has his plan. And human beings, even those of religious faith, we have our plans. And we have to understand, we learn from this, hopefully a principle, that what we perceive is the truth at one given point, and what, what we discern is not the truth, but what we discern is what God is going to do, God's will. Uh, we have to realize that we can oftentimes get it wrong. And Luke is going to give us an example of that pretty soon here. Okay, So I want to lift that out for you. Uh, and so Jesus said, as he also says in Matthew, in the Olivet Discourse, uh, as we call it, it is not for you know, to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority. Not for us to know. 
God has a plan. Okay? Um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So in other words, you are given a responsibility. Be open, receive the power that which God is going to give to you. That means we have to choose whether we're going to receive that power. It just doesn't automatically come on. We receive the Holy Spirit, but we have to surrender to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. There are many Christians who have access, every Christian has access to the Holy Spirit. But we decide, God never overrides our free will. We decide, you know, whether we surrender all, as is Pam Mackey's favorite hymn. She reminds me, when she dies, we got to sing, I surrender all. Okay? And I sang it with her. We, we looked at it this a uh, couple days ago in the hospital. Uh, we have to choose whether we're going to surrender to Christ and to the Holy Spirit. But it says, it's not you know the times set by the Father, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I want you to see, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to be witnesses. Universal witnesses. There, it's very true, Tammy. Um, that uh, Matthew ends with the Great Commission. Um, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Okay? Now, disciples, not just believers, but disciples. It's important for us to understand the difference between a believer and a disciple. Okay? A disciple is invested. That's the best way I can put it. Into living uh, close to Christ, having Christ involved in life. And a disciple is a learner, a continual learner. Uh, what does Christ want from me? How do I respond to my to the world that I live in with this faith in Christ? How do I share my faith through word and deed in my world and in the larger world? That's what a disciple in a nutshell really is. Not just someone I believe, so I have a life. It's someone that's invested. You can think of how many people, this is not to bring judgment on people, but we call certain people non-believers because they may believe but they haven't really become disciples. They are not invested. <coughs> it's really hard for me when I have to do funeral services, and I do that for nominal Christians. They've been exposed to Christianity. They may even say they believe. And I'm not questioning their salvation. What I'm questioning is whether they're living up to uh, the potential, I like to put it that way, the potential that their lives have because they fail to surrender their lives to Christ. And so because of that, they're limited in their awareness of Christ's presence and their giftedness and what God can do in and through. Do you feel that's a fair assessment or is that too judgmental? So then would you say an apostle is the next step above a disciple? Well, a disciple... They have to go out, they're the ones that are going to go right out and, you know, yeah. teach it. Where... Yes. What happens is that apostle is a particular... An apostle is a disciple. But a, an apostle has a responsibility. They build churches. We could say if someone goes out and all of a sudden, just like, let's say, I'm going to use a budget knife in John Carter. He started out in his apartment with his wife with having a home Bible study, believe it or not. Become that big edifice, that big church out there. God used him and called him to establish a church. Okay? So he had an apostolic gift that you and I might not have. But we are all disciples. Okay? So that's what an apostle is. Uh, in, in the New Testament here in Acts, the apostles are, were chosen by Jesus. And then because of the teachings that they would then in, in making of disciples, some of those disciples, as we'll read by Paul, took on an apostolic ministry of establishing churches. Okay? Apollos was someone who came to faith. They walked with Jesus didn't you know, say no Jesus, but he came to faith Jesus, and all of a sudden he became a great teacher, and he helped to establish teach, uh, churches. He had an apostolic ministry. Okay? So that's a good question. Um, any questions regarding that? That was good, Teddy. Thank you. Any, any other things that you might... Does that help clarify the difference between... They're in the black community, they will particularly identify some of their elders or religious leaders as apostles. Okay. Um, and usually those apostles are someone who helped to form a church. And so they noted as having 
greater authority or influence or respect or whatever. Um, you know, we tend to use ap ap the term apostle very uh, selectively, okay, and good, with good reason, okay. Um, so that's one of the difference. Uh, so we're to go into May and and what Jesus said at the end of Matthew chapter 28 is that go into all the world, all the world, and make disciples, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that baptism is important because it means that they're recognizing the Holy Trinity. Okay. Now why that was important is that because we Christians recognize not only God the Creator, but we also recognize that Jesus is God. Okay? Jews did not recognize Jesus as God. Okay? So by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are then recognizing Jesus as the Son of God, as the second person of the Trinity, which was very important. Okay? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and um, then teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So being a disciple means that person is teachable. They want to be taught. Okay? Some people want, don't want to be taught. You know, Sharon has mentioned many times, you know, why do more people want to be involved in Bible study? We offer men's study early on Monday morning. We understand why someone doesn't want to do that at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, we also offer this one. We also offer then study on Thursday nights. Um, there will be other opportunities that we have to try to, for people to learn and to, um, to be taught. But it has to be a decision that people make for themselves. I want to be invested in my relationship with Christ. Okay? Now, whereas Matthew says, uh, quotes Jesus saying, go into the, all the world and make disciples, it's reiterated here, wait uh, until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. That lets us know a little bit about what the Holy Spirit does. Okay? It gives us power. Now, we have to think about what that power might mean, and we'll talk about that as we go on here. I don't want to get into discussion of the Holy Spirit quite yet. And, um, but the Holy Spirit is something which motivates, changes um, us, transforms us, and empowers us. Okay? Um, and so that's part of the Trinity. Baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Understanding that the church or those people who followed God in the Jewish faith did not have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, Holy Spirit was selectively applied to people at different intervals through prophets in order to lead God's people. But what happens in Christianity is that the Holy Spirit is no longer selectively applied, but it's available to every follower of Jesus Christ. That means Think about it, the times in your life when you know and you sense that Jesus is with you, that God is with you. I want to stop just for a moment and have you think about that. Can you reflect on a time when you were very much aware that God was with you? I want you to think about what it would be like for you if you lived in which you didn't have that sense of awareness. In which God and following God was a matter of religion, of something that you inherited, something that you were taught, and something that you just followed. And just realize how important it is for us that we have that access to the very presence of God. When we take communion, it's not just, as we did this last week, and will be again uh, this Sunday, it's not just a ritual we go through. It is, as John Wesley and others you know, that there's a real presence that we sense and can be aware of, even in taking of the bread and the cup. Christ is with us. We have a demon. Oh, pick up ten years of corn on the way home. I love that. Now you know. Now you know why she texted me. Said she loved me. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, that's not the real reason. But anyways, so instead of the whole world, uh, he says here, "Be my witnesses in Jerusalem." World. Now, why did Luke specify that graduation from? You know, we could just said, "Be my witnesses to the world." 
Why didn't he just say, be my witnesses to the world? Why did he say, specify that in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth? He didn't want to make any question. He didn't mean everywhere. True. It also... Samaria was an anti-Christian, too. I think the Samaritans, so uh, he wanted to definitely include them, though. You know. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 See, I'll imagine there is a, a Jewish prejudice. Oh, do we have religious prejudice today? Hmm. You don't go there. <laughs> you already know what we do. Okay? Yes. And so Christianity offered itself to those who were rejected by normal religion. All people were welcome to become disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. There's still expectations, we'll find, about if you're going to be a disciple, what does that mean for you? But all people were invited and welcome. That wasn't the case in the Jewish faith. Okay? So what's also important in that is it starts out where they were. So we could tell that Luke was actually where the church began was in Jerusalem. Right? They were waiting in Jerusalem. So so he wanted them to to be able to start where they were at. So we are to start as disciples here in Kirkville with where we're at. We are to be concerned with our community, with the people in our community, we're to be a light in this community for Jesus Christ. But we don't just leave it there. There are some people who say, well, I don't care about the rest of the world, I just work here, concerned about home. Well, that's not living for Jesus. Jesus says, yes, be concerned here, but extend beyond Go to, to all Judea. So that means your county, your co greater community, right? Into Samaria. So those areas that make you uncomfortable. So even like feeding the homeless, which we'll do, is it next week? Um, that we're spreading the gospel through our care, and probably some, and sometimes through a message, to those within the city. Well, why? They're not in our community, really. But they're people that God loves. They're in our world. They're in our world. And then greater to the ends of the earth. So we are to be concerned more than just with ourselves, with our neighbors. It begins there, but it grows outwardly from there. Right? And if we can't minister well in our community, we cannot really minister well in the world. Right? So it starts at home. Uh, it starts at home for me. My first evangelistic deal is with my children and my grandchildren. And so, you know, I may not win my children. I know I've won my daughter. Okay? I struggle sometimes with my son. I love him. I know he believes, but he's nominal. I want to see him be like, So, he's got a dad as long as I get breath. He's got a dad and mom who never. We love him dearly, but, you know, Christmas time he's going to get most He knows it, you know. Uh, he knows that dad's going to be on his case. Mom's going to be on his case. Okay, but we're always going to be there. And maybe it'll take our death. To all of a sudden, to, for him to realize, gee, I've been blessed. Hopefully, the thing that we did was. And that he'll say, man, you know, um, maybe I need to to become more invested in my faith. Right now, he has no his sons are being, uh, you know, we're investing in our, our grandsons. Spirit life, prayer, and stuff like that is practiced every day in our home. It's one reason why that Kathy and I, that I decided that I was going to take early retirement, not really retire, I'm with you, but I didn't have to move anymore because I wanted to be near my grandchildren. I have a responsibility to be a witness at home. And then I'm a witness elsewhere, and I'm a witness in a greater, expanding way. Same thing for us. I, don't, I share that story because even if you have people in your life that are close to you, children, uh, you know, uh, uh, in-laws, whatever it might be, uh, we as Christians have the responsibility to be witnesses, not just passive. The word there for witness is an active witness. You know? Do people know where you stand? Do people know what you believe in? And it can be done in gentle ways. I'm not talking about taking a Bible and slamming someone in the face. You know, But that's an important calling upon. That's what God wants us to do. Isn't that something that we basically should not even consciously be thinking of it all the time, but the way we move our lives mm -hmm. so that people 
Well, maybe that when you send him a birthday card, you also include a birthday uh, as, as a scripture. Mm -hmm. It may be that, you know, like when my, my, I don't mean to pick on this, but he's just more concerned. Anyway, the, um, like when they were over for Kathy, we had ice cream cake that I picked up from Carlisle. You know, we had grace. Mm -hmm. He's there for that. He knows that's part of our life. If we mm -hmm. go out to eat together, he knows that's part of our life. It's a witness, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to hide that witness. Mm -hmm. And again, I know he believes. He's just so wrapped up in his own <laughs> life. He doesn't, you know, have, that's an excuse. But anyways, I don't want to that up. He knows. Um, but yeah, not that I'm going to go and preach to him, you know, but he's going to know who different means mm -hmm. how I feel. Um, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. See, try to visualize this. We don't take time to read something we don't visualize. Okay, they're there. They're in Jerusalem. You know? In another place, in Matthew, it's, it appears that when he was taken up from them, that they weren't in Jerusalem. They were out, you know, in Galilee, and, you know, and there's 500 present, and Paul tends to say that, and all of a sudden he was lifted from their sight. We don't know. Why did Luke say Jerusalem? Because maybe he didn't want to explain what happened between this and this, you know? Um, you can try to explain so much. So all of a sudden, uh, skips from one to another. He was taken from their eyes in a cloud. You know, where were the people in Jerusalem when all of a sudden this happened? So he doesn't tell them maybe they went back out to Galilee. You know, because he did tell them. You find in Luke, uh, tell my brothers that I will meet them in Galilee, right? And he did reveal myself to them. So there's unanswered questions. In your life and your faith, is there any unanswered questions? Yeah. Doesn't mean I'm going to question. But what's important? Um, there are things that maybe I do not know. I don't need to know. What's important is that I know what I'm to know. That's the important. Thing. Some people can't settle for that. Critics can't settle for that. But I know it's true because of the Holy Spirit that resides in me. I've experienced that, and I experienced the truth of His Word. So he's lifted out of their sight. I can't imagine how that life is up here. Mm -hmm. Into the clouds, you know. Uh, it's just kind of neat. You find that same type of thing happened to Elijah. The Elijah mm -hmm. saw that, and some other prophets saw that. He was taken up from them. Uh, there's other times that we see that, that kind of happen. And that he was going to be returning. Well, we read about that. But they were looking intently up at the sky as he was going, I would be too. You know, that's, oh. You know, this is not something you see every day. Okay? This is the same guy that appeared to them in the upper room and showed him his hands, his side, you know, said to Thomas, hey, touch me. Oh, no, Mother Jose, I believe, I believe, it's okay. Fell to his knees. Well, now just think about those who don't have the opportunity of seeing, yet they still believe that you would be. They're only going to perceive that through their witness and testimony. It takes more for us to believe. Because we don't have those physical signs. We didn't walk with Jesus. But the Holy Spirit is the gift that convicts us of what we have to. Oh, thank God for the Holy Spirit that we have. It's by faith that we live, not by sight. Who said that? Oh, I think Jesus did. Anyways, while they were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Now, why white? White is a symbol of purity. Okay? We find that in the book of Revelation and elsewhere. White. Okay? Uh, bleach was not something they had, so white was something special. <laughs> okay? <laughs> they didn't have Clorox yet. Okay? They didn't have tidy, white tidies. Um, <laughs> that type of thing. So and there was two. Why two? You should know the answer. Is you, why need, two? you need to have two people witness anything. Very good. How many angels were at the tomb when, Jesus, when the women went there and, and Jesus was revealed to them? Well, in one case it was two, but in another case wasn't it just one? One that spoke. But uh, yes. So two is a, is a, we verify two. So what happens with Christianity, we don't just take it for granted. We have the witness of the word. We have the witness of the Holy Spirit. 
that is given to us that confirms the word. We also have then the witness of Jesus Christ through the Spirit who lives within us. Three. And that's so important that we understand that. So all of a sudden there's these two, two dudes, maybe there's the two same dudes, dudettes that were at the, at the tomb. I don't know. I don't think they paid much attention to us. This is unusual. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? What would your response be? Well, look what's happening. <laughs> You know, this is not something we're used to seeing every day. You know, give us a break here. <laughs> we got to see the humor in this. I want to make sure I've seen what I see. <laughs> but there's, really, there's a reason why they're not looking into the sky. One of those questions that some people and some religions, even those who really deeply believe in scriptures and in Jesus, uh, oftentimes, as some critics have said, they're more heavenly minded and of not earthly use. You ever all they're looking for, oh, I believe, so I'm just looking for that time when I'm going to be with Jesus in glory. Yeah. Well, what about here? And that's what those angels were reminding them. You are here for a purpose. Didn't Jesus tell you that you are to be receive the Holy Spirit, so your choice to receive the Holy Spirit. And number two, you are to be my witnesses. That's actively witness to Christ. And make you know his teachings and values known and make disciples. Instead of just looking up in the sky. I know I have eternity. I'm not in a hurry to get there. Because I struggle with what that means. Okay, But I believe it. I believe it. In the funeral I have with Larry, I know Larry how. And, and I love him as a man. You know, His wife was, uh, was a woman who could not have any children. And he, she came and spent time with Kathy and I at Strong Memorial Hospital when our son was dying. Um, she became an aunt to, to uh, non-biological aunt to our children. She's Aunt Joni, and he was Grandpa Larry, because she was too young to be an aunt, uh, to be a grandma, <laughs> though she is 91 now. <laughs> Don't know if she cares right now, but that was years ago, you know. Um, anyways, that's, you know, um, so this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will be back, will come back in the same way you have seen him going. So not only Paul talks about, but Jesus talks about coming back in the clouds. He was taken away in the clouds. He'll return in the clouds. And some people have a hard time with the second coming of Christ. Oh, come on, coming back in the clouds. Hey, that's where he went, that's where he's going to come back. Which means for us is that Christ is not going to come as disappointed. And as someone that's going to be in this world, there's now some people, there's going to be someone, which we are told is going to be the Antichrist, who's going to come by and claim, I'm going to be the savior of the world. I'm going to use politics. I'm going to use technology. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to save humanity from itself. And they may even do good, but they're going to bring, you know, power and authority to themselves and glory to themselves. And it's going to be contrary to, to God and Christ. So one way we know if someone claims for our allegiance, a political thief, uh, a figure, or even a religious figure, if they don't point for Jesus and God to be the ultimate answer, but look to themselves, they're of the Antichrist. Okay? Clue that we're already given. So we're not going to be... Like, Go ahead. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. politics or anything, or spiritual things, but the Woods Inn where I used to work, um, they looked at this party. Well, when the people that bought it and restored it, the paper came and did a big article on it. You know, they would take the pictures, I and mean, they just took pictures all over the place. When they developed them, there was one picture that coming down the stairway, there was this white, like a cloud. Cool. And I mean, that's why the Jesus come back that way, and then just as much as these people were staring in the sky and we can be too heavenly minded and forget our earthly responsibility so also we can be too earthly and say oh it can't happen that way 
Okay? And forget that God is God. And God can do what God's going to do. And sometimes we just have to let go. And we say, I don't understand, but I accept. I don't fully comprehend what heaven's going to be like. I read about it. Mm-hmm. But you know, Jesus has never lied to me in this life. And I'm going to bet my life, I'm going to bet my eternal life on what he says. And those who do so um, have stronger lives, I've found, and greater confidence. And I've had the privilege of being at the bedside of people, praying with them, reading to them, being with the family as they left me. And I've seen many ways that people die. And I can tell you, just from my witness, that um, there is a difference in those who have faith. True, abiding, vibrant faith from those who do not. And so, you know, uh, that's all I can say to you. It's, this comes from my experience. It says, why do you, this Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go to heaven. So, if he's going to come back, why don't you focus on what you're supposed to do now? <laughs> okay? Now we have, going into a different section, in which in verse 12, uh, so Luke writes, then they returned to Jerusalem. So wait a second. We, <laughs> they were waiting in Jerusalem. Then we have, you know, Matthew kind of saying they're in Galilee and this ascension happened. And it kind of felt like in um, uh, the beginning here of Acts, that all of a sudden they were in Jerusalem too, and you know, waiting, and all of a sudden Jesus happened. A lot of parts of Jerusalem. I mean, just like saying, oh, if you go to Syracuse, well, maybe I'm in East Syracuse. Yeah, true. Mountain up there, or hill up there. So it's in Syracuse, they were in the Mount of Olives, which is still. That's true. But it says here he specifies in verse 12 that they had to be in Galilee. Must have been because they returned to Jerusalem. Now, if you know where Galilee and Jerusalem is, that's a bit of a distance. So they went by a bus and they, you know, took a bus trip because Jesus told them, I need you in Galilee. I'm not I'm joking. But uh, um, from a hill called the Mount of Olives, okay, from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. So that's Mount of Olives is where Luke says it's happening, okay? A Sabbath day walk. You can look up how far a Sabbath day walk. <laughs> when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And most presume that that is the upper room where Jesus had the uh, secured um, that they were then took the last supper. Okay? Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. Judas was James because there was a couple of Judas and Judas was Iscariot, you know, not among them. And these are also, if we look back at the Gospels, these are the disciples that are mentioned. Okay? So he reiterates who was there. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Okay, verse 14 is very important. So they're in prayer. What do they do when they're together? Well, we pray, uh, worship. Uh, and, the, and also, this is important, and the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, were also there. Okay, so it wasn't just the twelve; there were women there, right? And Mary, the mother of Jesus, okay, with his brothers. I wonder how she felt. That moment of sorrow that she had at his death, his burial, to also see him come back, and then also to ascend into heaven. Do you think she was filled with as much grief then? She had a shift. She might. But she had to endure that time of pain. Just as much as we have to endure that time of pain when we say goodbye to those who we love. But Jesus says, Paul says, uh, through, uh, Jesus says through Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 4, he reminds them, I don't want you to be ignorant of those who are asleep, not dead, but asleep in Christ. But when he returns, those who are dead in Christ will return with him. Oh, that should give us comfort and glory, uh, glorious freedom. Anyways, so they were not alone. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Now, I want you to imagine that upper room. Where'd they meet? Those 120 
gathered in there, okay? So this wasn't just the 12 disciples and a little group of them. We have to understand what I'm saying here. This is quite an entourage, 120, okay? And that included men and women. There may have been children there, too. What about the children that he raised to love? Could they have been there? Okay. Um, so then, and said, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning this. So they look at the Old Testament. That's the only scriptures they had at that time. Mm-hmm. They didn't have the benefit of what we're reading now. This was being written. <laughs> you know, they were writing it with their lives. Um, but they recognized that the Old Testament, there were prophecies that were given by the Holy Spirit. Okay? All scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Spoke along through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide of those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. If he was one of their number and also shared in this ministry but betrayed Jesus, are there those who might be in our number? Who might also betray the cause of Jesus? That's a rhetorical question. Hopefully you realize that. Those are going to be heretical. Those who are going to be used of, of Satan to corrupt religion even Christianity, might come from our midst because they're not willing to bow to the authority of Scripture, even as painful as it might be to us. Okay? With the, re- with the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell along headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines fell out. Isn't that lovely description? <laughs> Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called that field in their language, Ekanama, that is the field of blood, potter's field, which others, they use the field he bought to bury those who had no place. But that sound like him hanging himself, but he supposedly went out and hanged him. He did. But when he hung himself, he, the strain was, and they come down and don't. And never cut him down, and his. Sorry. They, they, what is the purpose of that description? That graphic description. It wasn't very nice. In other words, there is there are consequences to our faithlessness. He took his life. He paid the consequences. By his intestines, what that meant is that is that the core of who you are mm-hmm. is lost. Um, whether that was physically or whatever, you know, you know, um, David. Who cut him down? What happened? Um, you don't need to know. All that Peter was pointing out is that never Jew knew it. this was a terrible thing that happened, and he was the one who betrayed Jesus, and you know, it stands a warning to us. Okay? He was one of our numbers. That's a warning again. <coughs> just as Judas was one of just imagine, you know, walked with Jesus, heard him, saw him, what he did, and yet betrayed him. And we can, we've talked about this a little bit. What was his motivation? He thought he was doing good. And the Antichrist, he's someone who thinks they're doing good for God. Okay? But they're not doing it the way God specified he's supposed to be doing. So, having faith is one thing. But following God's will is another. I'll repeat that. Having faith is one thing. Following God's will is another. I surrender all, all to thee. I surrender. And Judas wasn't able to surrender if it wasn't for Judas, we wouldn't have all the things right. that we have. That's correct. God used it. God will use even those who are heretics, <laughs> even those who proclaim the wrong thing, God can use. But we who are disciples are to be alert and aware of deception. Uh, remember the description of Satan will come as an angel of light, a beautiful angel of light. So it's not just always the negative darkness, but... Um, Deception can come as what we think is truth. People what you believe. That's the one you gave. Okay? Um, with regard, to, he got for his wickedness. Jesus brought a field and he had a loan. Okay? For, Peter said, it is written in the book of Psalms, and so he quoted the Old Testament, uh, may this place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. Okay? That means this place be deserted. The scripture said, let no one dwell in it. Okay? Now let's, let that set in your brain for a minute. <laughs> okay? 
there. No one is to dwell in it, in this place. And may another take his place of leadership. Okay? So he's using the Old Testament to see what is it God wants. They were there praying. They were to wait for the Holy Spirit. Peter stood up as a leader, one of the twelve, and then he asserted this. From, no, in their prayer, they were probably reading their scriptures. They read the Psalms. Prayers, the Psalms was their prayer book, right? It's also should be a prayer book for us. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the persons who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, how is he getting this idea? Did God tell him? Was the whole, did the Holy Spirit tell him? Evidently not, because we never hear from the guy again. Ah, yes. We have here a story of the initial corruption of religion. Okay? Um, I'm not saying it was bad. God doesn't condemn the poor. Also, here we're an organization. We're waiting for what are we to do next. Oh, we can also have a church. We say, what do we do next? And the first thing I do, I remember a church that had um, that I served, I was sent to, that had a real big struggle because of the unfaithfulness of a previous pastor. And I don't say this saying that I'm faithful, but I'm saying that this person abused their position. He was removed. And the church had come down in one year from 400 attendants down to, when I got there, 34. And they all looked at me around a table. We had a potluck dinner, they were welcoming me and Kathy, and they said, well, they just looked at me, see, I can even visualize these faces around the tables, uh, 34 people, what are we to do now, Pastor? And I didn't have a strategy, so I said, you know, you've got a wonderful sanctuary right over there across the hallway, how about we go in there and pray? That's the one thing that I know that I did right, and we did other things together for correct. Okay, and they were built back up. You know, they're only twenty. They're still, you know, they're still struggling from the from that loss, but also the other things, COVID, and from you know other things I've had in our culture. But we began to build back up. The first thing we did, the thing I did right, thank God, was to say, "Let's pray." And what happened here? They were already praying, but did they? Did Peter ask them, "Let's pray about this"? This is what the Scripture says. But should we pray about this? No. He gave qualifications. Well, there should be qualifications that are going to be impossible, right? right. <laughs> so what's a, what's a reasonable qualification? I think of the book of discipline and all the requirements of these things. I won't go there. We won't go there. Okay? Um, but a good qualification. This person should be someone who was with us all this time, followed along, saw Jesus do these things and heard each I mean, that's good stuff. You know? Um, it's nothing wrong. Uh, for one of these must become witnesses with us of his resurrection. Okay? So they proposed two men. How they proposed, I don't know. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. See, they didn't pray about what they were to do. They then prayed about, between these two guys, how they determined who these two were. Were there others that had been there? Others that met these qualifications? We don't know. Okay. Um, then they prayed. That's why I would underline, then they prayed. <laughs> specifically about this issue. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. <laughs> then they cast lots. They cast lots. Now that's the lot <laughs> And so he was added to the 11 apostles. So they spat on, they had a coin and they tossed it or spat on you know, rock and tossed it in the air. You know, just as it was going to be the Real spiritual insight. <laughs> They didn't even take a democracy, okay? Let's have a vote. <laughs> you know, but you know, on their on their behalf, all they knew from the Old Testament is when they tried to figure out God's will, they didn't know quite what God wanted. They had the thumb and thumb, thumb okay? Thumb and thumb. In which, whatever that was, is a way they tossed and they prayed, and God, you decide how to run. Do we do that too? You know, Lord. Here's two choices that seem right. Okay? So, you know, we do our best and then we make a decision by somehow. I don't know if you decided by rolling some dice or whatever you've done. 
But somehow you have to decide. They did the best that they could. And so they chose Matthias. So he added to the 11 apostles. Now, was God in it? Why did you say they were never corrected by Christ or God for the decision they made? I do want to tell you that you do not hear of Matthias again. You hear the others as they went out and did stuff. History tells of what they did and where they went. I'm sure that Matthias was a good disciple and he did his part. Okay? We don't hear in the annals of church history of anything that Matthias did. You know. So maybe God said, yeah, you know, you did this on your own. But what happens was I think Luke is the reason why this was important to Luke. Because later on, we'll find of this man called Saul from Tarsus. And all of a sudden, no one voted on him to be an apostle. But guess what Paul did? He established churches. He was beaten and you know, persecuted in his belief by church history and secular history that he was executed by the head in Rome. He established communities of faith. And he literally took it to Samaria. He took it to the ends of the earth. And not he alone, there are others. But he's the one that really set the stage. Who was really the apostle? And Paul will say of himself, and those others, like, like, and, and particularly several of them, but also first Corinthians, I'm an apostle, you know, uh, inappropriately called so. No one questioned whether he is possible. But God chose him. But God chose him. You see, we can choose in religion the best things we think we, God wants us to do, but God has his plan. So that's the lesson I want us to learn that Luke kind of sets out. Here's humanity, okay? Here's, you know, the church. And the church does the best that it can, as religion will do. But God uses the church. But here's God's plan. And God, I think, laughs sometimes. But God will work out his plan, despite what we do, you know? So we can look at what's happening in our culture and in the church, and we can oh, shake our heads. <laughs> we can come up with our strategies and our plans. And God, God and Jesus you know, say, okay, that's cool. You're trying to do the best you can, but do the best you can, but I got my plan. And guess who's going to win out? I've got a towel at home. Actually, I had two of them. I had one down the kitchen here. I and it says, do you think he ever did that headache? <laughs> <laughs> I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, I, I think he's probably shaving his head going off. No. No. You know, we're going we're gonna to take a vote this, this Sunday. Tammy and I talked about it. You know, and this is going to be a simple vote. You know, and whatever we decide, you know, it really that it matters, but it doesn't matter. Because ultimately, God is going to have mm -hmm. his say. And our responsibility is to do what Jesus told us to do, that we know for certain that he wants us to do. Be disciples, be active witness for him, and let him take control of those things that we don't know what really he wants for us. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. I really think so. And I think, and I think too, as long as you feel that you're doing the best you could possibly do for God and yourself, then you feel all right. And yes. Like everything else is... Yes. Secondary and, and we should learn, and I think before we ever make a decision, that we need to have a separate time that we just say, we're going to pray. Mm -hmm. This is what we believe. Lord, ultimately, you know, we'll make our decision, but Lord, it's in your hands. And we're going to let go of that, and we're going to do what you want us to do. So we're going to pray you bless us. And if we do what you want us to do, we have confidence you'll be with us. And you'll take us into wherever you want us to go. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. So we're not going to be anxious and tied up in knots. We're going to do what God wants us to do. It may be, quite surprisingly, not what we expect, just mm -hmm. like Peter and the great church. Uh, you know, they never came back and considered, but they never did doubt once they interviewed Paul. It's all what he did on his own with Barnabas in establishing the church. You know, that was a Gentile church in Antioch. They never questioned his whole people because God's hand was on and the question is, who had to be an apostle? Yes, they never could have been. Ah, his life is work with his own credentials. 
Okay. We're going to stop there for today, and we'll begin with that pesky dis description of the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost next time. Okay. But if you have any questions or stuff, please write them down. And we'll open with those questions from what we just read. But that's my understanding from chapter 1. I think it's a great thing in which he talks about the birth of the church, but he starts out with the failings of the church. That wasn't really a bad failing. You know, it's just a presumption. Sometimes we do things in the church as a presumption. We're doing good, and it's the right thing. And later we find out, okay. So really we're at the hands of, of God and the Holy Spirit. A good study that we're, we're having this right now with what's going on with the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's true. Yes. So even if we might what is the church? despair the with what the schism that's in the church, this is not the first time. I'm not reading that in my book, too. And the, these are the schisms that what comes up, God does a wonderful thing to <coughs> Both for those on both sides. So, um, so don't be so anxious about it. God is God. We are not. Thank God. God is God. All right? Let's pray. Gracious and God, we thank you for your word. It reminds us that we sometimes get so tied up in knots that we just need to let go and let God. It sounds like a good bumper sticker, but you know there's so much truth in that. We just sometimes need to let go and let you have your will and your way. And because we are reminded that the church is not ours, it is Christ's. We are the bride. He is the groom. He is the head of the church. And we sometimes try, try to remove the head and put ourselves in his place. Whenever we do that, you always bring us back home saying, no, you let us go so far, but only so far. We trust in your plan and in your future, and we will just be satisfied with what we need to do that you clarify for us, to be your witnesses of the truth, and to follow you this day and every day. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it in the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I have something I want to share. Go ahead, please do. My favorite author is Richard Collins. Mm -hmm. He writes wonderful stories. Oh, I love him. Oh, faith in it. Right. I got a, he sent me a, a text yesterday. Yes, he did. 